بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته continuing with our journey through Kitab Tahara of Imam Al Hajawi Zad Al Mustaqna we've come to the second to last bab of this Kitab Tahara which is Bab Izalat Al Najasa the chapter wherein he talks رحمه الله تعالى about how to remove impurities what are impurities and how to remove them so first and foremost an najasatu hiya shay mustakhdara shar'an it is the thing which is despised in the sharia or considered as filthy in the sharia a shay al mustakhdar shar'an the thing which is considered as impure and filthy in the sharia why that's important is because it's not up to me it's not up to you what we consider as being filthy it's what the lawgiver allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his laws the sharia define as being that which is filthy and when the ulama they talk about this they generally say that there are two or three categories of najasa the first of them is najasatu ayniya najasatu ayniya the najasa wherein the actual object in of itself is inherently impure so najasa to ayniya is that which is inherently impure you cannot purify it right like the dog for example no matter how many times you wash the dog it's going to remain impure the second type of najasa is najasa to hukmiya to al najasa to al hukmiya the najasa which is impure in ruling okay that is what we know as an najasa to a tariatu an najasa to a tariatu meaning that something impure has fallen upon a pure object and made it impure for a period of time until it's cleansed so for example if a drop of urine falls upon this carpet in front of me the carpet is pure but by virtue of that urine falling upon the carpet it becomes impure until it's removed right so this is the second type of najasa and also they mention that a najasa is this is just a side point ma'nawiyya uh, najasa can be najasa to ma'nawiyya which is intangible impurity the impurity of belief and action right so that's the uh, another type of impurity so which type of impurity do you think the ulama are discussing in this chapter is it al najasa to al ayniya to or is it al najasa to al hukmiya al hukmiya right because this is the one that can be purified the second type of najasa the one which is not inherently impure in of itself so the author may Allah have mercy upon him he says yudzi'u fi ghasl najasati kulliha idha kanat ala al ard ghaslatun wahidatun tadhhabu bi ayni najasa zakallahu khair the author rahimahullah ta'ala he says that uh, it suffices that if the impurity is upon the earth meaning on the ground it suffices to purify that one washing okay which will get rid of the najasa so he means here that as a minimum one washing is required if you require more than that then you use more than that with the condition that it's upon the ground it's upon the floor the earth okay and this is taken from the hadith in bukhari where it's mentioned anna arabi bala fi masjid rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wasallam فَأَثَارَ إِلَيْهِ النَّاسِ لِيَقَعُوا بِهِ So a Bedouin, he urinated in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. So the people, they became angry with him and they rushed towards him to grab hold of him and to deal with him severely. So the Prophet ﷺ said, دَعُوهُ وَهْرِيقُوا عَلَى بَوْلِهِ ذُنُوبًا مِنْ مَاءٍ أَوْ سَجْلًا مِنْ مَاءٍ Leave him alone, but rather get like a bucket of water and throw that upon his uh, urine. Let him finish and throw that upon his urine. For verily you have been sent as people who make things easy and not people who make things difficult. So the proof from the hadith is that the Prophet ﷺ, when the person urinated, he said, leave him alone, rather get a bucket or a pail of water or something of that nature and throw that upon his uh, impurity, which is one washing. So from there, the author, he said that any impurity which is upon the ground, one washing suffices it as a minimum, right? 
So now if there's impurity upon the ground and you want to wash it, what may you have to do first before you wash the impurity? Exactly. So if it's got some physical nature to it, it's better for it to be removed because with the water it may spread even more. So you remove what you can and then you wash it to the best of your ability. So we see here that the Sharia is very natural and it's very easy. Most of the najasa in the, in the world is found upon the ground. So due to that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made ease for that type of najasa to be washed away and to be cleansed. Nothing particular has to be done except that you just throw water upon that area and it's washed away. طيب. He says, Rahimullah ta'ala, wa ala ghayriha sab'un ihdaha bi turab fi najasati kalb wa khinzir. Any other impurity which is not on the ground, then it has to be washed seven times. Any other impurity which is not on the ground has to be washed seven times. And if it's to do with a dog or a pig, okay, particularly the saliva, then this has to wash, be washed seven times and one of them with turab, with soil, okay? Because the Prophet said in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, Tuhuru inahi ahadikum ida walagal kalbu fihi and yagsilahu sab'a marat ulahuna biturab. That the Prophet ﷺ said the purification for your vessels, if a dog drinks from it or licks it, is that you wash it seven times. The first of those times being with soil. The first of those times being with soil. Okay, so this is a clear proof that the Prophet ﷺ said to wash it seven times and what? Uh, to ensure that soil is used in the first washing, right? So now this type of najasa, which is washed seven times, and one of it, which is turab, is for the dog and the pig, right? This is known as najasatun mughalladatun. Najasatun mughalladha. The severe type of najasa, which requires seven washings, one of them being soil, turab. Taib? Severe najasa, najasatun mughalladatun. Why is the pig added with the dog? Whereas the text, it stated only the kalb, the dog. Why, why is the khinzir added here? Qiyas, exactly, but what, what, what were they thinking? Exactly, the khinzir is akhbath. It's more filthy in our estimation, right? The pig is more dirtier than the dog. So according to this opinion, then the pig is also included in it. And this rule to, the ruling of the dog and the pig pertains not only to the, uh, the uh, tongue, but any part of the body. If it touches your clothing whilst wet, then it needs that same format, washing seven times with turab. The Imam, he says, that it suffices in place of soil in this type of washing that we are discussing, najasatun mughallada, the severe najasa. You do not have to use soil, but you can use something else, which is ashnan. Ashnan is a type of plants, and it's uh, used in a way as a kind of uh, cleaning solution. So anything like soap or anything which is known to clean can be used in place of turab, even if the turab is present, even if the soil is present, according to this opinion, right? Because why they reached this, they looked at the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that we just mentioned about cleaning the dog, uh, the dog's saliva in the vessel seven times, one of it with turab. They said this is ta'lili and not ta'abudi. Ta'lili meaning that it's based, the ruling is based upon reasoning and it's not based upon just submitting to Allah without knowing the reason. So they said the reason here of mentioning turab was that it's good for cleaning. It's good for cleaning. Therefore, if it's good for cleaning, we know that soap, etc., is more effective in cleaning than the turab. That's why they allow other things apart from the soil to be used because they looked at it with another, with the looking of it being ta'lili, meaning that it has a reason, and we can understand the reason from the hadith of using the turab, which is to clean. Therefore, anything which is more cleaning, more effective in cleaning than turab, we can go ahead and use that, right? Other Hanbali scholars and the Shafi'i scholars, they say no. They say this is something which the Prophet Sallallahu specified in the text and there's a reason for that specification. And today in the uh, modern technology, scientific discoveries, some of the ulama, they said, it's because of what is contained within the saliva of the dog. 
that the microbes, harmful microbes found in that saliva cannot be removed by anything thoroughly except for turab, except for soil. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Then he says, وَفِي نَجَاسَةِ غَيْرِهِمَا سَبْعٌ بِلَا تراب. And in other than the first type of impurity, there needs to be as a minimum seven washings, but without turab, without the soil. So the first najasa, najasatun mughalladatun, the severe najasa, the najasa of the dog and the pig. That's seven with soil. Everything else after that is seven washings, but without turab. And this is known as najasatun mutawasitatun, that the middle level of najasa, the middle level of impurities, right? So like for example, urine, azzakumullah, defecation of any type, this type, this type of najasa has to be washed seven times. And this is based on the qiyas of the licking of the dog, okay? So they said that the licking of the dog is an example and there's much more, there's other najasat which are more filthier than that in the eyes of the sharia, like urine, etc. So they said if that requires seven times, then everything else requires seven times. They made qiyas based upon that hadith. And this qiyas is from Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah ta'ala himself, right? As mentioned by Sheikh Mutlaq al-Jasr in his explanation, video 9. Another narration from Imam Ahmad and the opinion of, of Ibn Qudama is that all of the najasat, apart from the pig and the dog, they only need to be washed as a minimum once. Okay, this is the opinion of Ibn Qudama rahimahullah ta'ala and one riwayah, one narration of Imam Ahmad that all of the najasat only need to be washed as a minimum once. The Imam, he says, وَلَا يَدْخُرُوا مُتَنَجِّسُونَ بِالشَّمْسِ and the thing which has become impure, like when the urine drops upon a pure carpet or pure clothing, it cannot be cleansed by the sun. So what he's saying is that if you leave your clothing out in the sun, you come back later after a day, you find no traces of the najasa, you cannot see it anymore, you cannot smell it anymore. He said, even though that be the case, this is not accepted as a ruling. So the sun, according to the Hanbali scholars, is not a way of purifying the najasat, right? And the same goes to the wind. The wind is not purifying. And nor is rubbing the najasa. If you rub it off, that doesn't suffice. And nor is istihala. Istihala is that the najasa, the impurity, goes through a process and completely becomes something different after that. Okay? So it goes through a process, whatever that process be, and it changes into a complete different substance with complete different properties. They say none of this is allowed for purifying the impurity, right? Because the Prophet ﷺ in the hadith of the Bedouin, when the Bedouin came and he urinated, the one that we mentioned before, didn't the masjid have access to the sun? The sun could come through? Yes. Didn't the masjid have access to the wind? Yes. But the Prophet ﷺ didn't consider any of those, but rather what he considered was only water. So they say based upon this, water is the only thing that can purify the najasat, the impurities. Tayyib. <coughs> and the proof they use for istihala, istihala we said is that process whereby uh, it goes from one state to another state. The proof they use that this is not permissible is in the hadith collected by Imam Tirmidhi and authenticated by Shaykh al-Albani is where Ibn Umar, he said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam anil akli jalalati wa albaniha that the Prophet ﷺ forbade eating the Jalala, Jalala and its milk. Jalala is that animal which some of its feed or some of its nourishment or much of its nourishment is from impurities. Okay, it could be the impurities left behind of other animals or other types of impurity. So this animal feeds and nourishes itself on dung, etc. Other types of impurity, right? So this is known as Jalala. So where is the proof? The proof is that it's eating this, but when it goes into the body, it doesn't remain as dung or that impurity, it changes into blood, it changes into milk, etc. Right? With, with some animals, this is the process that takes place. So istihala, the change of the state took place. They said even though that's the case, the Prophet ﷺ forbade it. He said that the animal that is eating these impure things, you're not allowed to eat it, nor can you drink its milk. Right? So even though the process of istihala was taking place, the Prophet ﷺ forbade it. And some Hanbali scholars, another opinion, like Ibn Taymiyyah holds, that they allow it due to a variety 
of evidences that they hold. But the author's opinion and the majority in the madhab, they say no. Ghayr al khamr He says, except khamr except for intoxication. Now this is an exception, an istithna, an exception from the rule which he just established. He said that istihala is not accepted as a purifier for the impurity, right? He said, except in the state of khamr because in the hadith on Sahih Muslim, Anas radiallahu anhu narrates that so'ila Rasulullah sallallahu sallam anil khamr tu'takhadu khamran khallam faqal la that the Prophet sallallahu sallam was asked about alcohol which is taken as vinegar and the Prophet sallallahu sallam said no it's not allowed what he meant here is that the, the person he got the alcohol and he put it through a process of istihala the person the human being did some process to the alcohol and turned it into vinegar. Here the Prophet ﷺ said it's not allowed. So they say if it changes by itself and not with human intervention, then it's allowed. So istihala in the case of alcohol turning into vinegar by itself without human intervention is allowed. Okay? That the khamar which is impure will become pure if it changes into vinegar by itself without human intervention. Also, there's another case. If you go back to the thoughts that we had pertaining to water, there's a type of water that can have istihala as a ruling, applying to it. Can you remember it? So a change takes place in the water, and then the ruling of that will be that the water is now purified. Huh? No, that's human intervention, right? You are, you are adding something to it. This one is when there's mountain kathir. There's a lot of water, which means above qullatain, and it's become impure by impurities, right? It's above qullatain. So the impurity has affected it. One of its properties has changed. That's how we give the ruling of more than qullatain being impure. But you come back after a week or a month, and due to the, uh, the wind blowing that impurity away or whatever, then the water changes and it returns back to its natural state of being pure. So in this situation, it's also applied as mentioned by Mutlaq Jasr in his explanation, video 9, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So he says, فَإِنْ خُلِّلَتْ أَوْ تَنَجَّسَ دُهْنٌ مَاعِئٌ لَمْ يَدْخُرْ So as we said that the process of changing alcohol to vinegar, if that is done by human intervention, then this is not acceptable. Or if you come to a situation where you have oil or liquid grease, liquid fats uh, that have become impure, that something impure has fallen upon them, then they cannot be purified. So he's saying that if you have fat, right, or grease or oil or anything of that nature, where an impurity has fallen in it, then it cannot be purified. Let's look at that. Abu Dawood, Rahimullah Ta'ala, Nisa'i in Bayhaqi, they mentioned the hadith with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, إِذَا وَقَعَتْ الْفَأْرَةُ فِي سَمْنِي فَإِنْ كَانَ جَامِدًا So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if the fa'r, the, like the rat, okay, falls into the, uh, the oil or the fat that you have, he says, if it's jamidan, if it's um, solid, then what you do is you take out the rat and that which is around it and then that's all in well, well and good. فَإِنْ كَانَ مَعِيًا فَلَا تَقْرَبُهُ But if it's water, if it's liquid, this fat and grease, then don't go near it, meaning that it's impure and you cannot purify it. So the humbly scholars, based upon this hadith and others, they do not differentiate between liquids which are other than water. So when we come to water, we differentiate between that which is a small amount of water and a large amount of water in the difference of rulings, right? But with liquids which are other than water, if an impurity falls upon it, then it cannot be purified, according to this hadith and according to the opinion of the humble scholars, right? So they do not differentiate here. Another riwayah of Imam Ahmed and held by Ibn Taymiyyah is that if you're in the situation like that, that we mentioned, and the, the, the fat is liquid or oil, then you just take out the rat and you take out what has been made impure around it and that suffices you. Okay, that's another riwayah. But the one that our author holds is as we mentioned that it doesn't become pure. وَإِنْ خُفْيَا وَإِنْ خَفْيَا مَوْضِئُ النَّجَاسَةٍ غُسِلَ حَتَّى يُجْزَمَا بِزَوَالِهَا He says, may Allah have mercy upon him, 
if the najasa which has fallen becomes now hidden to your eye it's hidden from you you cannot recollect where it is or you cannot determine where it is for whatever reason then you have to wash until you become sure certain that it has been removed excuse me so as an example in your thobe you have two sleeves right right and left left and right you know for sure that the urine dropped on one of your sleeves but then you forgot or you became unaware but you know for sure urine is there but you're not sure you cannot determine which sleeve it is what do you do you have to wash both right like this so he says whenever you're in that situation you do the amount of washing which will lead you to yaqeen that for sure you removed that which needs to be removed what rule is this based upon we've taken it a few times al yaqeen certainty is not removed by doubt right al yaqeen la yazul bi shaq certainty you are certain that the najasa uh, fell upon it the only way it can be removed okay al yaqeen yazil al yaqeen the only way it can be removed is that um, it has to be another certainty to remove it okay so you wash it to the extent where you are sure that it's been removed the imam rahimullah he says wayathuru bawl ghulam lam ya'kul at'am bi nadhhihi he says now he's talking about a third category of najasa which is known as an najasatu mukhaffafa al najasatu al mukhaffafa okay the light najasa or the easy najasa the easy impurity so we took the mughallada which was the dog and the pig right that needs seven times and it needs what it needs turab then we took everything after that we said mutawassita middle level najasa it needs seven times washing without turab now this is an najasatu al mukhaffafa najasa which is little light all this needs is rush nadh the word he uses here is nadh yandh yandh is you get a bit of water and you throw it onto the place like you sprinkle right a fair amount of water a handful of water onto the place this is based upon the hadith in bukhari the hadith of uh, um qais bint mihsin radiyallahu anha is narrated anha atat bi ibn laha saghir lam ya'kul at-ta'am ila rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wasallam that she let, let me finish the hadith come to she came uh, anha, with a young baby of hers or a toddler that hadn't yet started eating food it hadn't yet started eating food to the Prophet Sallallahu so he took the Prophet Sallallahu took this child and put it on his lap this child urinated on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi so the Prophet ﷺ called for water and he didn't wash that area rather he did what we said was nadh nadh to sprinkle he sprinkled water so here we find in the hadith that we have the qaid that if the child is young right to the extent where he doesn't desire or he doesn't eat solid foods he's only on his mother's milk okay overwhelmingly on his mother's milk then this child the boy if he was to urinate then his uh, urine is washed just by sprinkling, right? And this doesn't apply to the girl. So the ulama, they make a tafriq between the boy and the girl. This is not based upon evidences. This is just based upon reasonings that they have. They say maybe it's the case that the boy is lifted up more than the girl in most cultures, right? And therefore the sharia gives ease for the uh, impurity which comes from the boy in, ter in terms of his urine. Or maybe it's a case that the urine of the girl has different properties, that it's more filthy than the urine of the boy and Allah knows best. In any case, what we're establishing here is that najasatu al mukhaffafatu is the urine of a young male toddler that hasn't yet started eating solid foods. That this urine is to be treated just by sprinkling it, right? If you wanted to do so, that's all you have to do. Sorry, you had a question. Sorry. Just, just clarify. Hmm. The first level is the dog, the pig, where you've got to wash. The seven first. times. And, and turab. Second is just with water. Seven second is with water, but no need for turab. You mentioned before that, um, like for example, to wash away something one time is sufficient. That's if it's on the earth. That's if it's on the earth, right? Zakallah khair. 
So also connected to this al-mukhaffafa, which we're saying is the light and the last category of the najasa, the third category, the lightest, is the issue of um, al-madhi. Al-madhi is that which comes out from the man when he thinks about erotic thoughts or he has foreplay. It's a liquid which comes out and it's not thick like sperm, right? So this is based on the hadith in Sahih Muslim where Ali radiallahu anhu, he says, Kuntu rajalan madha. He said, I was a person who used to experience a lot of this madhi, this excretion. وَاسْتَحْيَيْتُ أَنْ أَسْأَلَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ صَلَّى لِمَكَانِ إِبْنَتِهِ And I was shy to ask the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم because I was married to his daughter. فَأَمَرْتُ مِقْدَادِ بِنْ أَسْوَدِ So I commanded مِقْدَادِ بِنْ أَسْوَدِ to go and ask. So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, يَغْسِلْ ذَكْرَهُ وَيَتَوَضَّى Okay, that he should wash his private area and make wudu. That's all he has to do. Just wash it and make wudu. So it's, it's, it's a مُخَفَّفَ It's an easy type of najasa to remove, right? You have to sprinkle water on your private part and then go ahead and make wudu. The Imam now, what he's going to talk about for a few moments, he's going to mention the things which are overlooked when it comes to najasat, overlooked impurities. So he says, It's overlooked in other than liquids. It's overlooked, so put in brackets, in other than liquids, and other than foods. What is overlooked? Yasir dam najis. What's overlooked is a little amount, a little bit of impure blood, right? What's overlooked is a little bit of impure blood. Min hayawan tahir. If it comes from a, a pure animal, hayawan tahir. What they mean here by hayawan tahir is living beings. Any living being which is pure, then it's overlooked. The living beings which are pure, according to the Hanbali scholars, is first and foremost the human being. Second most is the category of animals that we are allowed to eat, right? Third most is that which is a, a, the size of a cat or less than a cat. So these three categories are considered uh, tahir, animals or beings which are tahir, pure. Human being, what did we say the second one was? Animals we are able to eat. Animals we are able to eat and the third is the cat and that's that which is less in stature, le less in size than the cat, right? So the Imam is saying as long as it's not in liquids, the impurity, the blood, right? Because blood as a ruling is impure in the Hanbali Madhab, right? Blood as a ruling is impure, right? We'll mention some exceptions to that in a moment. So as long as it's not in liquid and it's not in foods, okay? Then the impure blood from the pure animal, from the pure animal is overlooked, right? If it's a little amount. And yasir al dam, it has to be a little amount. So the Hanbali scholars, they have blood as three categories. Najas blood, impure blood, right? That is overlooked if it's a little. Najas blood that is overlooked if it's a little. This is the human, blood of the human and blood of the tahir animals. Category number one, right? This is what is overlooked if it's a little. If it's najas, it's najas the second category and not overlooked. This is any blood which comes out the private parts. Okay, it's not just and it's little bit will not be overlooked that which comes out of the private parts and that which is considered pure blood is the blood of the shaheed, the blood of the martyr, the blood of that which is harvested from the sea and the blood of that which is slaughtered according to the sharia and left in the throat or in the veins or in parts of the meat. Okay, that is also considered as being pure blood. That's not pure blood, that's flowing blood, right? That's considered impure. If it was a little bit of it, then that would be considered allowed. Yeah. See? So what did he overlook? He overlooks, and there's ma is, uh, Imam Ahmed claims the, oh, sorry, there's ijma upon this issue that it's overlooked, right? A little bit of blood in these situations is overlooked. If we said it's a little bit and it's not in liquid, it doesn't fall into liquid, nor does it fall into food, and it's from... Hayawan Tahir is from uh, beings which are pure, okay? Beings which are pure, then this is overlooked. And also in the next issue which he will mention, this, this ijma also, that it's overlooked, right? So before we get to the next issue, another riwayah of the madhab, okay, and held by Ibn Taymiyyah and others, is that all of the najasat, any type of impurity, if it's a little amount, 
customarily, then that is overlooked. Any type of najasa. That is another opinion in the madhab, right? But here, the author and those who agree with him, the majority, they say only two types. These little bits of blood, as long as it's not in liquid or food, and also now this, this issue which he's going to mention now. وَعَنْ أَثْرِ الْإِسْتِجْمَارٍ بِمَحَلِّهِ And also what is overlooked from the impurity is when you go to the bathroom and you defecate and you made istijmar. Istijmar, remember, is to use solid, something solid, okay, like stones, etc., to remove the impurity. He says, what's left behind in its place? In its place, fi mahallihi means it hasn't traveled to the cheeks and beyond, right? If it's in its place, it's normal place of uh, excreting, then that is overlooked. What is overlooked? That which can only be washed by water. So you know the person, he cleanses himself, but then there's something left behind which is known as a trace, athar, athar najasa right? This is only removed by water. That which is only removed by water, as long as it remains in its place, then it's overlooked as a najasa, right? So it means that if it connects to your clothing, then it's not overlooked. But if it stays in that place, then it's overlooked. Tayyip? Yes, according to the Hanbali scholars. The majority of what I'm mentioning in these classes is what the Hanbali scholars mention. And once in a while, I'll mention a second opinion in that madhab. And less than that, I'll mention something out of that completely. Inshallah. وَلَا يَنْجُسُوا الْآدَمِيُّ بِالْمَوْتِ And now he mentions that which is not considered impure. He says that the human being is not considered impure by death. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Isra, وَلَقَدْ كَرَمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ Verily we have given honor to human beings, right? In the sight of Allah subhanahu wa human beings are in a state of honor, created with honor. Therefore their essence is not impure, they're not impure. And in the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu said in Bukhari, المؤمن لا ينجس That the human being doesn't ever become impure. طيب. What about the non-Muslim? Because Allah says in the Quran about them, إِنَّمَا الْمُشْرِكُونَ najis. That verily, for sure, the, disbelief, the polytheists, those who commit shirk with Allah, they are najis. Najis means impure. I just told you human beings are not najis, but then here we're asking the question that Allah says that they're impure. Ahsanta. Najasa ma'nawiya. Good. Najasa ma'nawiya. Remember the intangible impurity, the spiritual impurity. So this verse in Surah Tawbah refers to them being impure. However, Shaykh Ahmed Khalil in his explanation of this book, Zad al Mustaqniya, he said it's very probable, due to the evidences and uh, the many opinions of the scholars, that the kafir, though he's not impure in life, right, after death, he becomes impure. After death, he's considered as being impure, and Allah knows best. And the author, he says also, what is not impure? وَمَا لَا نَفْسْ لَهُ سَائِلَةٌ مُتَوَلِّدٌ مِنْ طَاهِرٌ And that creature which doesn't have flowing blood, as long as it comes, as long as it is born of pure beings, right? That creature, like an insect, as long as it doesn't have flowing blood and it's born of a tahir, that which is pure, then is considered as being pure. I'll give you an example. In Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا وَقَعَ ذُبَابُ فِي شَرَابِ أَحَدِكُمْ فَلْيَغْمِسْهُ ثُمَّ لِيَنْزِعْهُ فَإِنَّ فِي أَحَدِ جَنَاحَيْهِ دَا وَفِي الْأُخْرَى شِفَا The Prophet ﷺ said, if a fly falls into the drink of one of you, then dip it fully into the drink. Submerge it, right? For verily, in one of the wings is a cure, and in the other's other wing is the disease. So where's the evidence from here? Where's the wajhu dalala? The wajhu dalala is that this thing is now dead, and it's now in your drink. And the Prophet ﷺ told you only to dip it and take it out. Had it not been pure, it would have meant that your liquid, your drink would have become impure. But because it's small and it doesn't have flowing blood, then it's considered as pure. So any insect which is small, when you kill it, you squash it with your teeth or whatever, right? It doesn't have flowing blood, then this is considered pure. But he mentioned the condition, he said, as long as it's not nourished or it's not born of that which is impure. So you have, for example, cockroaches that live in the bathrooms. 
they're nourished and they're born of impurity. So those are not considered within this rule, right? And then he said also that which is not impure, he's mentioning, And that animal which you eat, its urine, okay, its dung and its sperm is considered pure. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ in Sahih Muslim, he said, Sallu fi marabid al ghanim Go ahead and pray in the stables of the sheep when he was asked about it. So where is the proof here? That urine and the dung and the sperm of uh, animals that we eat are pure. Exactly. When you pray in the stables, you're going to find urine from these animals, from the sheep, and you're going to find feces. However, the Prophet ﷺ didn't rule that as being impure. He allowed you to go ahead and pray there. What if somebody says to you, how about the Prophet ﷺ said, don't pray in the stable of camels? Doesn't this contradict what you're saying? Hmm? The Prophet ﷺ said that in an authentic hadith. Maybe in the same hadith from what I remember, don't, when he was asked about this. So how do we understand this? Huh? It's an exception. It's an exception, it's stithna, but why is it stithna? Because, because that one, the Prophet ﷺ, they say it's due to the nature of the camel, that it's dangerous. It can harm you, right, if you're there. Whereas here, the Prophet ﷺ is uh, pointing to the fact that the dung and the urine won't affect you. In any case, we're saying that it's, uh, it's urine, it's uh, dung and it's uh, sperm is considered as pure. Is there another proof that you have for urine being pure of these animals, of animals that we eat? Yeah, say it. That's right, when the Prophet ﷺ commanded some people or, or recommended to some people that they drink from the urine of certain camels. Point mentioned here by Sheikh Mutlaq Jasr in his explanation video 9. He said, look, the Prophet ﷺ didn't tell him, go ahead, fill up the bottle and drink it. This is not what the Prophet is saying. He was saying وسلم, to mix it with something, to mix it with milk or to mix it with other type of food. It's not purely drinking from urine of a camel. It's not something of that nature. And also that which is considered pure and not an impurity is the mani al-adami, the sperm of uh, human beings. Why? Because in Muslim, Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, لَقَدْ رَأَيْتُنِي أَفْرُكُهُ مِنْ ثَوْبِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ وسلم, فَرْكًا فَيُصَلِّي فِيهِ she said, you would see me scrubbing it off, meaning the sperm, from the clothing of the Prophet wasallam, and he would go ahead and pray in it. Okay, so this is a proof that it's pure. How is it a proof that it's a pure? It's pure. That he prayed in it, right? After it being scrubbed off also. If it was impure, he would have to wash it off. Because we said about 10 sentences back that dalk, rubbing, and you could put with that scraping, doesn't suffice in removing the impurity. Water has to be used, right? However, there's other narrations where Aisha radiallahu anha, she would wash off the sperm from the thobe of the Prophet sallallahu How do we understand the two? Here she's saying, I would scrape it and the Prophet sallallahu would go ahead and pray. And another narration, she said, I would wash it off. Wash. Close, close. It depends on the amount and the, the, the makeup. Exactly, Ahsan. So here, if it's dry, you rub it off, right? And if it's in that situation, you wash it off, recommended to wash off, not because it's impure, but due to having good appearance. Okay? Due to having good appearance, not because it's impure. And he says also what is pure is rutubatul farjil mar'a, the, the wetness which comes from the private part of a woman. Now, this wetness which comes from the private part of the woman is that wetness which comes from the tract connected to the womb, not the tract wherein the urine comes from. It's the tract which is connected to the womb. It's a type of liquid, whitish liquid that comes out from the woman, right? This is also considered, it's not the sperm of the woman. This is also considered pure. This is also pure. This is translated normally as saliva, but it means the leftover drink or the leftover food. So the sur of the cat, okay, and that which is equal to it or less than it in size, okay, وَمَا دُونَهَا فِي خِلْقَةِ طَاهِرٍ The leftovers of the cat are considered as pure. 
in the hadith in Ahmed, Abu Qatada, radiallahu anhu, he was making wudu. And there was a, somebody was observing him. And as he was making wudu, there was a cat drinking from his water. And he helped the cat to drink further from the water. And he explained to the person who was looking that the Prophet ﷺ said, Innaha laysa bin najis. Innaha laysa bin najis. Innaha min tawwafina alaykum wa tawwafat. This is not impure, meaning the cat. So if it drinks from you, whatever you, water you have or any food that you have, it's not considered impure because it's from the tawwafin, it's from those which are generally found to be around you. Okay, it's from that which is generally found to be around you. So the cat and that which is less than it in stature, if it drinks from your water or eats from your food, then your food is still considered pure, as is your water. Now he's going to mention some impure animals, right? He says, وَالسِّبَاعُ الْبَحَائِمْ وَالطَّيْرِ The wild hunting type of animals and, uh, and the birds, right? Because in Sahih Muslim we have two hadith, the one from Abu Huraira where the Prophet ﷺ said, كُلُّ ذِي نَابٍ مِنَ السِّبَاعِ فَأَكْلُهُ حَرَامٍ Every animal that has fangs, then to eat it is impermissible, right? So if it's impermissible to eat, it means it's impure, right? And also the admiration of Ibn Abbas where the Prophet ﷺ said وَكُلُّ ذِي مِخْلَبْ مِنَ الطَّيْرِ And every bird which has claws is also to be considered as impure. However, that which is caught by the bird, caught by the bird, the hunting bird, is allowed for you to eat, right? Because in Surah Al-Ma'idah فَكُلُّ مِمَّا أَمْسَكْنَ عَلَيْكُمْ Eat from that which they have caught for you. So every wild animal which has fangs or birds which have claws are considered to be impure. And also, وَالْحِمَارُ الْأَهْلِيُّ وَالْبَغْلُ مِنْهُ نَجِسَةٌ And the domesticated donkeys and mules from that are considered as being impure. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said in Sahih Muslim, <coughs> excuse me, he said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ يَلْحَيَانِكُمْ الْحُمْ الْحُمْرْ فَإِنَّهَا رِجْزْ الْحُمْ الْحُمْرْ فَإِنَّهَا رِجْزْ Verily, Allah and His Prophet forbid you from the flesh of Al-Humr, of the donkeys or the mules, for certainly they are impure. Okay? If it's wet. A wet. Yeah. Okay. Wet. Instead of being wet, right? Because it's impure. فَإِنَّهَا رِجْزْ Right? According to this opinion. طيب. So the flesh of the donkey and the mule is considered as being impure according to this hadith. Just a linguistic point here. The word al-humr, if it's mentioned with the dhamma, al-humr, then it pertains to jam al-himar, the plural of donkeys. But it's, if it's mentioned with the sukun on the mean, al-humru, okay, then it pertains to the plural of uh, red, ahmar. So people mix this up in the hadith uh, that the Prophet ﷺ mentions it, where he said, that for one of you to call somebody to Islam is khayrun lakum min humrun na'am is better for you than the red camels the camels that were red were extremely valuable in those times so in that hadith the Prophet ﷺ mentioned it with the dhamma here is mentioned with the so in that hadith mentioned with sukun here is mentioned with the dhamma because it's the plural of of what? of donkeys Taib, quick recap in the beginning we said that if the najasa is upon the earth what do you do? One wash, right? That suffices as a minimum. If you need more, you go ahead and do minimum. Then we started with what is known as a najasatun mughalladatun. That najasa which is severe najasa. How, many, how do you wash that? Seven times? With earth, right? So that pertains to who? To, to what? The pig and the dogs, right? So you have that. That is mughalladatun. Then we went to mutawasitatun. Najasatun mutawasitatun. The middle level najasa. And we said, how do you wash that? Every other type of najasa? Seven times without uh, earth, right? Seven times with water, without earth, like urine and feces, etc. Then we had najasatun mukhaffafatun. We had najasa, which is the least type of najasa, the lightest type of najasa. And how do we wash that? Nadh, sprinkling, rush. You just sprinkle water upon it. And we gave two categories there. We said it's the urine of a, a baby boy that doesn't eat food, right? And Madhi. 
and Madi. And then we went ahead and we gave some exceptions which are overlooked. We said that the, the blood, which is a little bit and it's not found in liquid, nor is it found in food, that is overlooked if it's from a pure animal. Okay? So blood as an essence is najas, but a little bit of it is overlooked. And also what is overlooked? The trace of what you leave behind when you go to the bathroom. Okay? As long as it remains in its place. The trace meaning that which needs to be washed off by water. That which removes the physical amount, that's an impurity. But that, that which can only be removed by water, that's overlooked as a najasa. If it remains within its place, meaning if it doesn't go into the clothing, etc. Tayyib, and then we mentioned a few other things, but those, those were the main important things. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Wa jazakumullah khair.